Good evening and welcome to Justice Talks, a webinar series sponsored by the Sing Sing Prison Museum. The museum's mission is to tell the extraordinary story of Sing Sing Prison's 200 year history in a way that challenges all of us to imagine a more equitable justice system and to build a better society. While the museum is under development in Austin, New York, we have created the Justice Talks webinar series to explore various topics, including history, criminal justice reform, and stories from people impacted by incarceration. I am Ronnie Bartley, a member of the museum's board of trustees. I am very pleased to co-chair the webinar committee with my fellow museum board member, Sam North, the webinar committee with my fellow museum board member, Sam North, a faculty member at Ossining High School. As a committee, we plan to bring you more engaging topics involving Sing Sing's history and the criminal justice system. We're continuing this work tonight by having a conversation with Elizabeth Gaines of the Osborne Association and John Valverde of Youth Build to discuss service in the interest of justice. Liz leading the way at the Osborne Association has impacted me as an educator, a mother and a wife. The Osborne Association helped me to empathize with students who have incarcerated parents, provided me quality time with my family utilizing the family center, what we call the playroom at Sing Sing, a place that every week for a five hour span, we were able to co-parent and spend time as a family without the feeling of being in a maximum security prison. And believe it or not, where both of our children took their first steps. My husband, Lawrence Bartley, also took healthy relationships course where at the end of that program, I was able to participate with him and several others in a one day connecting couples workshop. It allowed me to see my husband peel the layers of the incarcerated person and become unguarded and vulnerable. It allowed the participants to feel free to verbally express their love and hold hands without being told you're too close, no hand holding or no cross visiting, a program that I intend on advocating to get back for people on the inside and for the formerly incarcerated and their significant others. And I am publicly announcing that I will volunteer Lawrence and myself to give back by facilitating some of those workshops. These programs provided by Osborne were truly a gift and I can honestly say that it brought our family closer together. And I wanna thank the Osborne Association for that. And I wanna thank Liz for leading the way in helping to keep families connected. I'm gonna now introduce Lithgow Osborne who will be the moderator for this webinar. Lithgow is a board member of both the Sing Sing Prison Museum and the Osborne Association. He is the great grandson of Thomas Mott Osborne, who was the warden at Sing Sing Prison from 1914 to 1916. During his brief tenure as warden, he created a unique organization called the Mutual Welfare League that was later incorporated into the Osborne Association. Lithgow has very generously donated many artifacts from his personal collection to the museum. I wanna let everybody know that after the conversation with Lithgow, Liz, and John, there will be time for comments and questions from the audience. So you can put your questions in the chat if it wasn't addressed already. And finally, I want everybody to please note that this program is being recorded and it will be posted on the museum's website. So with that said, I will now turn it over to Litka. Oh. <clears throat> Thanks, Renee. Um, it's a pleasure to serve with you on the Sing Sing Prison Museum Board. As Ronin mentioned, my family has been deeply involved in criminal justice reform for more than a century. Um, 
I am personally committed to the mission of the museum to tell the story of Sing Sing Prison, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to discuss the past and imagine what we want the future to look like. As Dostoevsky said, a society should be judged not how it treats, by, not by how it treats its outstanding citizens, but how it treats its criminals. Tonight, we have two individuals joining us who believe we can do better, who believe we must do better. As a member of both the board of the, of the museum and the OA, I am delighted to welcome Liz Gaines and John Valverde to tonight's webinar. We will hear from John in a few minutes, but I want to start with Liz. Liz Gaines is, a, is the president and CEO of the Osborne Association, a nonprofit criminal justice organization. During her 38 year tenure, the 88 year old nonprofit rebounded from a two person office to one of the country's largest and most effective organizations seeking to transform the criminal justice system. Osborne serves 12,000 plus individuals a year in New York City, Newburgh, and Buffalo, 30 state prisons, and Rikers Island, with programs that include family, educational, employment, treatment, and housing services. In 1986, when her children's father went to prison, Liz established Family Works, the first comprehensive fatherhood program in the men's state prison. President Obama recognized her as a White House champion of change for children of incarcerated parents. She received her BA and JD from Syracuse University and began her career in the aftermath of the 1971 Attica Rebellion as a criminal defense and prison rights lawyer. Liz, John, thank you both so much for joining us tonight. I, um, I want to begin with Liz. Um, Liz, can you tell us a little bit about how you, um, you began your, how you got involved with the Attica, um, you know, in the criminal defense and the prison's rights aspect of it, and then how you segued over to Osborne. I know there's a few years in between, but, um, I was hoping maybe you could share with us a little bit of how you got started. Sure, well, I was either lucky or unlucky enough to be in law school in Syracuse in 1971. It was my last year of law school and the incarcerated men at Attica Prison um, had an uprising. I had actually been working on uh, people charged in an uprising that was at Auburn a year before. So I had already as part of my sort of law school, which was not why I went to law school, but there we were near Auburn, near Attica. And one of the things when I was going to look for witnesses um, in the case was the thing that I confronted, which is the same thing you have confronted and everybody who does this work has, which is that when you go into a prison for the first time, if you're not ready for it, you are just overwhelmed by the humanity of the people who are there and the terror of the conditions under which we think is appropriate to hold human beings. Um, and so while it wasn't planned, I ended up working on the defense of the Attica brothers. And when that was over, um, I was already kind of bitten by the idea that that um, prisons, transforming prisons like like Osborne does for the people who live in them and work in them and visit them was worthy of a life's work. Um, but while I started as a prisoner's rights lawyer for prisoners legal services, um, I did discover that being a lawyer was not all it was cracked up to be. Um, you were always on one side or another. And if you won, you weren't necessarily providing anything for the people you were serving. And if you lost, what ended up was that people were just in worse circumstances. Which what is, time I gotta come pick you up? You have your mask, right? Yeah. Um, in, in between 8.30 and 9. Ronine? Ronine, better mute. Okay, she did. Okay. Um, so it seemed like an obvious choice for a recovering lawyer to try to uh, come to something like Osborne where your whole role would have been was to really work on the transformation of individuals and the system, rather than always be in a one side um, or another. 
And coming to Osborne was like a dream because it, it was at the time it had been small, but as you know, um, your great grandfather had put forward a really amazing concept, which was that the walls were there to keep the public out as much as to keep the incarcerated people in right. and that the opportunity was to be able to sort of open the walls, even if you couldn't literally walk people out that if people could just see the humanity of who we hold incarcerated um, that we believe something would change. Unfortunately, the prison population ballooned during my original part of my career from I don't know, I think when your great grandfather was uh, at Sing Sing there were probably 6000 people in prison in New York uh, by the 80s with the drug war we were over 70,000 um, today it's 30,000 so progress is possible right I think my father still talks about the time that uh, he met you and he he's very proud of the fact that he and he claims that he hired you he did and I, 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 I'm <laughs> well aware of that but I, I'm sure he did it in um, but he is um, extremely proud of that. And he said that that is his greatest gift to Osborne. And I can only um, reconfirm that for myself. Um, uh, I am constantly amazed at the success and the, um, how much Osborne has grown in the time that you've been there. Um, I only came on the board in the late 80s. Um, so I've only known, I've only been working with you 30 years, 30 some odd years. <laughs> My father's a little bit longer than that. Um, can you talk about some of the highlights of your, of your time at Osborne? Well, I think the, you know, the biggest one in many ways is what Ronin was talking about, which was shortly after I got to, I arrived at Osborne, um, my children were two and six and they're father was arrested and I did what you know every Jewish mother would do which is to try to find a psychiatrist or some kind of help or therapy or support um, and there, there wasn't anything and the people would say well we would treat this as any other abandonment or we never really thought about it I talked to our pediatrician he said well if you're going to take your children to jail they need more TB tests like that was the extent of of what was possible but um although their dad, my husband and I were separated at this point, we really felt like we needed to raise our children together, um, that it was important to maintain this. And although he was incarcerated in Virginia, um, I lived in New York. And from my history with Attica and Prisoners Legal Services, I was, I still knew a lot of the people in corrections. And I counted on the fact that at that time, it was almost all men in corrections. And I thought, well, they're men, but they're fathers. And so they probably think that fathers are important. And so I was able to figure out somehow that even though I couldn't do much for my children's experience when they visited in Virginia, I could see what was needed. And I really also wanted to be around other people that had the same experience. I wanted a life full of people like Ronin who were going through the same thing I was going through. And um, but the funny thing around Sing Sing was we started, I convinced them that we should do this, that we should have a fatherhood program, but I didn't want to do it if it didn't involve the family. So it included this idea of having a family center for the children and families to visit and also the parenting class, but also providing services for the whole family. And we started at Taconic because at the time it was a men's prison. And they didn't want me anywhere near a maximum security prison. They thought, you know, let's just do a medium. But then Taconic was closing as a men's prison. And they said, do you want to work with the women that were? And I said, no, not so much. We really want to work with dads. Um, I have nothing against women, really. But I just felt like dads was the right thing. And it occurred to me that if we chose Tapan Correctional Facility, which was on the same campus as Sing Sing, that we could kind of worm our way into a maximum security prison without anybody really noticing. Because as you know, the school at Sing Sing and the visiting room at Sing Sing were serving both Tepan and Sing Sing. 
So to me, being able to do it there, um, mm -hmm. and you know, just an aside, I grew up just on the Hudson River south of right. Ossining, and um, I'm old enough that at the time they would tell us that um, every time the electricity ran out, that that meant that they were executing somebody in the electric chair at Sing Sing in their efforts to terrify us. And they largely succeeded. It was actually not that long after the Rosenbergs had been executed. Um, so to me, to come back to Sing Sing and to be able to do that program, to be able to see the Bartleys and a whole lot of other people um, enjoy to the degree that you can enjoy a visit, to me, that's been the most satisfying thing of everything. And now, of course, it's in eight prisons and more places, but that's kind of it. Yeah, I have to say that um, I, I um, at your urging, I, I attended some of the early um, classes for the men. And I was just, I mean, I thought it was a good idea at the time. And, you know, I went in there and it's only as good as the, the, as the, um, the effort the men put into it. And they were extraordinary. It was mind blowing to me. And I was, you know, I walked away from uh, the classes just thinking that this was, you know, transform that it was transformational. And um, I, um, and of course I've loved, I, I love seeing how much the, um, the visitor center, you know, the children's visiting center, you know, gets bigger, you know, and more decorated and more toys and, and um, so every graduation, it always seems a little bit more lively, so. Unfortunately, COVID has uh, kind oh, of closed God. it and has had difficulties and I haven't been back in a while, but I still have to say that I would count among my closest friends and people, the people that I met at Sing Sing, either while they were incarcerated and, or their family members and people like John that, have stayed in my life. So, um, and the thing I loved about the classes was we had a lot of men who actually weren't fathers, but who were had been had had fathers. And mm -hmm. so the opportunity really was how do you be a presence in the life of a child and what what's possible for for people in relationships. And you know, Renin was talking about the relationship classes. That's what to me has been so important is being able to reach so many people um what uh in, let's see, we'll um step back a little from the specific but um what is the biggest need um the osborne uh, the osborne that the osborne association is addressing right now in your from where you sit or stand well, it's interesting because the one thing that has persisted as being a strong need is not one that until recently we really were totally able to do, which is people need to be able to return to a safe, stable place where they can lay their head down on a pillow and feel like they're home. And um, over the last several years, we've been we somehow convinced the state to give us a closed prison that we can redevelop as a transitional reentry center for people who don't immediately have a home to go to. Um, hopefully, while they rebuild their families and find a way to get back either home or with others, however they describe it, but that's been a huge need um, because prison breaks families apart. And so even if you had a family before you went to prison, when you send somebody 400 miles away and hold them for a sentence that Methuselah couldn't do, you end up breaking up families. And so while I wish that all of our work could be about connecting people to families immediately, and some of our really exciting programs are involved in trying to make it more possible for families to bring people home. I think that the biggest unmet need right now probably is safe, stable housing for people who leave. Not everybody has Ronin to go home to. I think this is a great moment to introduce our, um, our other guest, 
Um, John Viverde is the president and CEO of Youth Build USA. He joined Youth Build in, uh, Build in 2017 after decades of work as an advocate for creating access to opportunity and removing barriers for formerly incarcerated and marginalized people. John began working with imprisoned individuals in 1992 to ensure access to HIV AIDS counseling, high school equivalency instruction, alternatives to violence programs, and college education. In 1998, he co-founded Hudson Link for Higher Education, the first privately funded accredited college program in New York's prison. As a leader of lived experience, who is incarcerated at the age of 21, John is a true reflection of the importance of healing and equity, of second chances, an example for young people of youth build who are seeking their own second chance. Welcome, John Valverde. Thank you so much, Litko. Congratulations as you get ready to launch the opening of the Sing Sing Museum. It's great to be here with you and always great to be with Liz. Thank you. So John, um, how did you meet Liz Gaines? Well, you shared a little bit about my background. And in 1992, uh, after being sentenced to 30 years in prison, uh, of which I would have to serve a minimum of 10 before I would be eligible for parole, I arrived at Sing Sing Correctional Facility. And shortly after, I met Liz Gaines. I was uh, 21, almost 22 years old at the time, and I thought my life was over. Mm -hmm. I could not see a future for myself, and I, frankly, I wanted to give up. Early in my incarceration, my father said to me, accept full responsibility for your crime, seek to make amends, and say yes as much as you can to help others, and you will find purpose and meaning and be free. That conversation changed my life. And Liz Gaines was one of the people who opened the door for me to explore what that life could be. Meeting her humanized me and began the process of me believing I could have a future. She showed me there were people who cared and who were willing to come inside a prison to provide education and opportunities to grow. Maybe one day I could be more than the guilt and shame I felt at the time. And even though I was not a parent, Liz just referred to this, I had a father and I wanted to rebuild my relationship with my father. Mm -hmm. And she inspired me to enroll in Family Works Parenting Program, which she shared so beautifully about just now. And to this day, 30 years later, I credit the Family Works Program and Liz Gaines for setting me on a path to learning and growth and meaning and purpose and also healing and even redemption. And for the next 11 and a half years after meeting Liz in 1992, I was incarcerated at Sing Sing that, that full period of time. And I would see Liz all the time in the school building, uh, her with Osborne and Family Works. And I saw her often enough that I felt she saw me, mm. that she could see me, hear me, understand me. And I'm sure thousands and thousands over the years have felt the same way. I will always be grateful for meeting Liz and the day would come where I would even work for her and with her as part of Osborne. Um, um, wow. Uh, I get emotional every time you talk about, you know, your, your time and, you know, the impact that Liz and you know the talk with your father it's it's very moving and um, um, tell me about your work at Osborne well uh, it's an interesting story um, and, and if I can just back up a little bit because I think this is critically important to why I ended up uh, working at Osborne but in 2006, after being, having been denied parole for the third time, um, and now having served 14 years in prison at that point, Liz and Osborne were still there standing with me, even though I had been transferred out of Sing Sing a few years prior. Uh, Osborne, as Liz just said, was already in, in other prisons at that point. 
And I joined something called the Long Termers Project, uh, which was created in partnership with Osborne. And it utilized the curriculum called Coming to Terms. And there I faced my guilt honestly in a way I had never before, including working with a clinician to understand how my life had shaped the person I had become the day I committed my crime. And also being able to clearly say for the first time, I will never be the person I was that day ever again. And I had taken a major step in my healing. And as part of that long-termers project, Liz and Osborne supported me with my fourth parole board hearing in 2008. And I was granted parole and released in May, 2008. Uh, but Liz had other plans about May, 2008. Uh, since my case had been highly publicized uh, in the early 90s, the media was following my release very closely. So Liz, through her amazing relationships that she'd built over the years, orchestrated my release five weeks early on April 22nd, 2008. So in addition to all she had already done to support me, she was now the reason I was released on Earth Day, which I think should make her an honorary environmental justice climate justice warrior, not just a criminal justice uh, champion. Uh, but again, the story doesn't end there. In 2009, when President Obama's stimulus package included funding for green careers, Liz, of course, was at the forefront of securing funding to create the first green jobs training program in New York City for formerly incarcerated people. And Liz asked me to be a part of the team that would launch Osborne's Green Career Center. And over the next seven years, uh, uh, I would grow professionally uh, with her mentorship and under her leadership. And I remember the day in, in 2016 when I came to Liz and informed her that I was pursuing an opportunity to become the president and CEO of Youth Build USA. You know, she didn't want me to go but she supported me 100%. Mm -hmm. And in 2017, I was appointed uh, the new leader of Youth Build USA. And among my references were Liz Gaines and Brian Fisher, uh, the former New York State uh, Commissioner of, uh, uh, of the Department of Corrections and Community Supervision. And today, Brian and I serve on Osborne's board, which mm -hmm. is of course, another part of Liz's role in my life. And today I'm the first formerly incarcerated CEO of a nonprofit with a global mission and one that is not specifically involved in the criminal justice uh, uh, world. Uh, and Liz has even supported me in breaking barriers mm -hmm. to being a leader outside the criminal justice field. Uh, so that's a little bit about uh, how I got to Osborne, how Liz created the runway to getting there and how I grew under her leadership mm -hmm. uh, to where I am today. Wow. So the question I'm going to put to you, because you're sitting here and so am I, um, as Liz prepares to um, transition or step down as CEO of all Osborne, what do you think her legacy will be? <laughs> you know, I, I, no, I, I, I appreciate the question. It's the right question. I have so many thoughts on it. And I really, well, first, let me say that I think uh, she's going to be contributing more to what her legacy will ultimately be because she's not, she's far from done at, at this point. And I'm excited about whatever's next for her after Osborne. And I would have to say that for me, uh, today, at least, her legacy would be about how I define success, and I think about how the world defines success for individuals released from incarceration. And I think success is not just about being out of prison and struggling to survive or out of prison, but homeless, which is why the Fulton uh, uh, Project is so incredible and so important, as Liz just named, uh, or being unemployed or living in constant fear of judgment and rejection from the world or addicted to substances or and without a network of support, of caring, positive people. For me, success is experiencing a sense of belonging 
and worthiness in society. There has been some healing from past trauma. Guilt and shame do not overly influence one's identity. One has an ability to use one's voice and advocate for oneself. One has humility, self-compassion, and empathy for others. And one takes a high level of responsibility for one's life. When people are told they are enough, and the individual believes that, so much is possible. My thoughts on Liz's legacy for me personally is that she always made me feel that I was enough. She believed in me, uh, certainly before I was ready to believe in myself. And that's probably the first point on legacy. The second point for me would be this sense of family and connection and community. And that's what Family Works was all about, uh, an effort to keep families together and not let the criminal justice system destroy family connection and community. And finally, I would say her legacy for me is no one should be defined only by the worst thing that they've ever done, but by who they are today and who they can be in the future. And uh, Liz, will be part of my life uh, forever for those reasons. Oh, thank you so much for that. I'm, um, it, I, I asked the right person. So um, I uh, my <laughs> personal note, um, I have many is a time when I've been in inside with Liz and <laughs> I've heard of uh, them, they, the men and women sometimes don't remember her last name. So they call her Miss Osborne. And as a result, Liz now is, um, considers herself to be an honorary member of my family. And as you know, there's no arguing with Liz Gaines. She will win the argument every time. So, and on that note, um, I personally am grateful to Liz for her um, vision, for her tenacity, her, her unbelievably hard work and her ability to make tough decisions when they needed to be made. Her legacy at Osborne, Osborne would not be what we are without Liz Gaines. That's a fact. And I think that my great grandfather would be thrilled and just in wonderment that his 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 idea, his the the thing that he started is still going strong. And that's down to Liz Gaines. And that's all, you know. There are many times when it's possible, I'm sure, that it could have just all fallen to the wayside because of one problem or another. But she, she kept the faith and kept it going. And I, for one, am eternally grateful. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. It's all true. OK, so now we're going to open it up to the audience and see if there are any questions from the audience. I'm sure there are gonna be questions. So I'm not sure how this portion of the, how it works, but uh, I'm sure somebody from Sing Sing or Ronin will step yes. in. Yes, I, I am now here and I can now speak. I'd like to apologize for that. <laughs> but um, as a parent, I had to multitask because my son told me at the last minute he had a dress rehearsal. So I apologize, but hey, this is life, right? So the question, a question from the audience is, and this is for Liz, um, what gives you hope in terms of criminal justice reform initiatives? Well, I would say in part, and I really appreciate what John said and Lithgow, but um, you know, you don't, one person doesn't build an organization. Um, and it's the same thing that gives me hope is the thing that actually built Osborne, which is that the people who are most have been most directly affected, the people who I met when they were in, who now work at Osborne and work at Youth Build and work at all 
all of our that and you know within our system and outside of our system um i'm not crazy about the credible messenger idea i think people are credible because of who they are not just because of that one experience they're whole people but i would say that what gives me hope is the opening that we have um for the ways in which people like john but not and lawrence and tons of other people have gone out into the world and made the case just by their example that people can come out of a prison and build up a country, um, which is me sort of slaughtering a poem by Ho Chi Minh after he came out of prison where he said, people who come out of prison can build up a country. And then he said, when the prison doors are open, the real dragons will fly out. So I would say that you know, what gives me hope is the young dragons that are coming out and also the old ones um, who are finally coming out in, in more numbers and should come out more. But um, there's really no way that you can um, replicate personal experience. And empathy does require being able to really put yourself in someone's shoes. And I think there's plenty of people who've never been incarcerated who are capable of deep empathy and have made a big difference for Osborne, including many of our board members and many of our staff. But at the end, what really gives me hope is watching people actually transform themselves um, and then contribute to this movement because they will not, they'll, they will call you on your, you know, bull. Um, and that's, that's really important because you really could get a big head, especially after what Lithgow and John were saying. You could start feeling like, oh, look what I did. But I know who did it, and it wasn't an I. It was most definitely a we. Um, and we had to fight hard to make sure that people who came out would get permission to be able to go back in. That wasn't always the case. Um, but people going back in sort of were able to prove the fact that they had so much to contribute so and also what gives me hope is not just the people that have come back either to work for us or another organization it's kind of like what john was saying was going out to youth build or lawrence going to the marshall project or all the people that find themselves in other places because one of the things that that did was when they did that study that showed that one out of every two families in america have had someone in their family arrested or involved in the criminal justice system it shifts everything when people realize it's not just them it's us it's what happened in the aids epidemic as well it started out with nobody knew anybody and it was this big stigma and then at some point unfortunately everybody knew someone and someone that they cared about so i think that that's the shift that i've seen is that people no longer not so many people feel like it couldn't be them, that they're not walking in their shoes. So that's what I, that's what gives me hope is, is, and Ronin, definitely you. Thank you. I wasn't expecting that, but thank you. Um, another question for you, Liz, is somebody wants you to say a few words about how the Osborne Association grew out of the Mutual Welfare League. So the Thomas Mott Osborne may have been somebody's great grandfather, but for me, he was like some nutty guy in central New York who had this rather odd idea that, um, again, that I said that people inside, and he actually went in and lived as an incarcerated person and met men that he called his brothers and saw a possibility. And the possibility was something that now people talk about mutual aid and the idea that people, I mean, it's sort of like the idea of AA and, and a lot of other ideas, right? Which is that we can help each other, that it's not, not it's that we don't have to wait for the government or, or Osborne Association or somebody out there to make a difference for us. That, that we can share and barter and help each other. And I think at that time, the idea of what he called inmate self-governance was 
I mean, honestly, they thought the guy was crazy, right, Lithgow? I mean, he didn't really last that long because the idea, they just weren't ready for it. He was a little bit ahead of his time, right? And so the idea generally wasn't like holding an election, like that kind of self-governance, but it was really this assumption that the best people positioned to help us are, are our own people. And so I think um, when he, he had a, a, what's the word when somebody follows you, like his protege was this um, guy, Austin McCormick, who ended up actually being uh, the corrections commissioner under Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia. And he was the, considered the father of correctional education. And he really confirmed this notion that if you just give people the tools that they need, they will rise. Um, what's interesting is at Attica, when um, the men said, we are men, we are not beasts, and we will not be driven as such, Thomas Mott Osborne had actually already said, when you treat men like men, they will rise. If you treat people like beasts, they will not. Um, I also have a family who's entering. Um, I need to microwave my mac and cheese. I know you have to microwave mac and cheese, but could you wait till I'm done? She um, will starve to death while you do it. Yeah, if you're going to starve to death, it will be okay. Um, so, anyway, so the idea, which I was inspired by, um, the idea of correctional education, that people can help each other, that they can learn what they need to learn. So I think that that was really, but I was lucky because when I got to Osborne, Mr. McCormick, who had been my the executive director for 40 years, had died about five years before. So I had the ideas about Mutual Welfare League and I had the ideas about correctional education, but um, I had kind of an open way of, of doing it. But I really believed that the idea that we could be there for each other was kind of a core spiritual belief that underlied everything we did. Thank you. Um, and thank the person who, um, who interrupted a little bit. I feel so much better now. <laughs> um, a question for you, John, um, is why was it important for you to help bring college back to prisons? Uh, I, I was very fortunate to have been able to complete my undergraduate uh, degree before college was removed from, from prison at, at Sing Sing. And it had uh, been such an important part of my own uh, personal transformation journey. And it had also contributed to the environment, uh, the community uh, of all of us who resided at, at Sing Sing. Uh, and that's so much of what Liz even just referred to. And, and I know Osborne does this, Youth Build does this. You know, we work to create these environments where one way to say it is that people are safe and they can be brave and they can work through their transformations. And I think it, it's also about uh, creating the conditions where people can discover themselves and grow and become the next greatest version of, of themselves. And I think that's absolutely true at Osborne and, and Youth Build. But to bring that inside to a prison is what, education meant to me and what I think it meant to so many others who benefited from that experience in a classroom in the school building at Sing Sing where Osborne was across the hall doing family works we were on the other side doing the certificate in ministry and later uh, Hudson Link for higher education in prison and I think when you're incarcerated, one of your biggest goals is to grow each year if you can, become better each year than you were the year before. But to do that on your own or just trying to get a book from the library uh, isn't enough. You need caring people around you, you need teachers, you need mentors, you need programs. And Hudson Link and college was the vehicle where people could actually see in a tangible way the progress they were making in their lives and almost feel like I'm at university 
uh, despite the realities of the concrete and the bars, I'm in a place where I can grow and I can become uh, more. And then of course, the incredible uh, vehicle that education was uh, for parents to inspire their children uh, to pursue their education and uh, dream of college because even their father uh, and of course, uh, mothers too uh, were examples to to children for what could be possible for them. So, I think it started on the personal level, moved to the organizational level of wanting to to have a greater impact. And I think today, all of us can be proud to say it's part of the systems change level too. And uh, I feel grateful to have been able to be a small part of that work at, at Sing Sing. And I, I would like to personally thank you for um, allowing my husband and uh, people who he lived with there at Sing Sing that opportunity, because as you said, it really did help them grow and it gave them a sense of security and confidence and it, it made them feel better coming outside, holding on to something that they earned. Um, so I wanna thank you for that. Um, question for both, both John and Liz, how has COVID affected the missions of Osborne and Youth Build and keeping families united as successfully as the program has in the past? Hmm. Well, I, 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 I can't say that it would be as successful, right? I mean, people need to touch people. And when they shut it down, um, there was nothing truly that you could do to make, make that, other than that maybe that it made people realize how important in-person visiting was. And we've actually, for three straight years, I think, been trying to push legislation in Albany to what's called protect in-person visiting, because although New York state prisons do have contact visits, many jails do not. And it enabled us to begin to really talk about the difference it makes when people can truly be together with their families and, and things like that. I think that um, on the other hand, we discovered that we have had as high participation and, and graduations in our workforce programs and in our substance use treatment programs. Um, because as soon as when people came out, we handed them smartphones so that they could um, be able to connect by Zoom. And it kind of forced people to learn, especially people coming out of prison who'd been in there for a long time and had never even seen a cell phone, to learn how to you know, exist in the digital age. And um, people's attendance was really great. Um, everybody showed up. We did a lot more individual work and we got to know people also because we were doing grocery deliveries and we were able to work with other organizations to actually put cash in people's hands. So I think that our whole field, I don't mean just Osborne, all the organizations that do this work, I think we're pretty nimble at trying the best we could to shift as quickly as possible. Um, but anytime you take away the ability, I mean, you can't social distance in prison. Um, the, the level of distrust that incarcerated people had of vaccines, uh, understandable. Um, and so it was, you know, it was the biggest challenge we've ever had, frankly. And I think it's gonna be a long time before we know the long-term effects on our mental health and the, of our children um, and the impact on relationships. Um, I, I don't, I, I think it's going to be a while before we really know, but I think that, um, I mean, we just had another outbreak at a facility where we do the visitor um, hospitality centers, where we, you know, just got, you know, tell your staff not to come this weekend, we're shutting it down again. And that has got to be so hard for people. I mean, I was only able to bring my children four times a year because um, their dad was 500 miles away. And in many states that are not New York, you were allowed, I think, seven hours a month of visiting. 
Um, New York, frankly, I, people complain a lot about it and I understand it, but if you compare it to anywhere else, it, it's been generous, particularly with family reunion, which they have just now uh, you know, resumed. So um, I, I think people have tried, but I, it's just really, really hard when you can't touch the people. Agreed. And um, John, even though Youth Build is not a criminal justice um, organization, how has COVID affected um, the mission of Youth Build? Uh, well, si similar to Osborne and, and Liz's involvement in, in the growth of, of Osborne, you know, we're, we're an organization committed to social justice. We support young people aged 16 to 24 who are out of school and out of work. 85% uh, of our young people uh, in this country are young people of color. Youth Build exists only in communities that are, I hate these labels, but that are economically disadvantaged. They also have many beautiful, amazing things about them too. Uh, but as a result, I think it's important to say, and I know Osborne stands in this space as well, you know, COVID has only further exposed the disparities uh, that we've been fighting for and fighting against and fighting to reform and change, you know, for our, our, our lives, our careers. And it really positioned Youth Build uh, uh, to support these young people uh, in the most creative ways they could. So like Osborne, we shifted to hybrid. Uh, we provided young people with the technology that they would need. We did hands-on training in people's uh, backyards or in the streets in front of their uh, communities because we're based in communities so we could collect and, and uh, gather young people together for training. And I just have to say, and, and Liz and I have talked about this, uh, just how incredible our staff uh, has been in managing through this and being a support for participants at Osborne, for young people of Youth Build. You know, we talk about essential workers, and I think that means something different today. And the, the staff at Osborne and the staff at Youth Build USA and in local Youth Build programs around the world, uh, it's just so much clearer how essential they are uh, to creating a world that works for more people. And uh, I'm just proud of the work that Osborne's doing. Uh, during COVID to be there for, for people and, and also youth build. Thank you. I have um, two more questions, really three, but um, the third is pretty general. I'm gonna go to the question that for Liz, it says, why is it so important for the proximity bill to become law? Well, the proximity bill is law and it is supposed to be implemented by this month. Mm -hmm. And be, because it's important because New York State is huge. And even though it has fewer prisons than it used to, most people would ordinarily be incarcerated over 100 miles from where they're from. And the proximity bill says that people should be incarcerated close as close to home as possible. Um, for parents and it's really for children to be near their parents and it's important because visiting is hard um, and getting to Clinton from New York City or getting frankly to Sing Sing from Rochester is really hard. Um, so we worked really, really hard and I think it has taken docs longer than expected to be able to fully implement it because of COVID uh, because they couldn't do transfers without a lot of quarantines they couldn't put a bunch of people on a bus to move them so they they're they've just decided to close six facilities and they're going to begin i think to move people around probably the easier ones are probably um children of mothers in prison because there's one women's prison upstate and one downstate but there's actually only one woman's maximum security prison so there's some limits to what they'll be able to do um I think for the men, once they get to it, they'll be more flexible. We, we think they will start with um, kids who might be in foster care where there's it's gonna be more difficult to get those kids to visit because they have to be taken through the system and then begin 
to work more toward um, making sure that people can get visits wherever possible. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, um, Liz, what are your plans? <laughs> we asked John what your legacy was, but what are your plans as you transition from your role at Osborne? Well, unlike, you know, people that work in the corrections department who have pensions, we don't. <laughs> so I will continue to do something. But what I really want to do is one thing is I want to volunteer to teach in the long termers program. Mm -hmm. I believe that that work with people who have done long sentences and particularly in homicide cases is the single most it's, it's the littlest program. Mm -hmm. I think it's the single most important thing that we do that the, the gift of people to themselves of being able to fully embrace the fullness of who they are, understand what they did, be able to be responsible for it, and then make amends and move forward. So I want to be a volunteer in that program. Um, and after that, I don't know. What what do you got? <laughs> I'll have something up my sleeve. Don't worry. We'll okay, I'll come work for you. <laughs> if, if all else fails, I told John I'm going to go work for him. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds like a plan. Um, okay, I'm going to end it there because it is 6.56. We promised one hour. We know that Liz has um, another function to attend. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. And I just want to hand it over to Sing Sing's um, executive director, Brent, to have the last words. Well, thank you, Ronine, for leading this uh, this program. Lithgow, thank you so much. And Liz Gaines, uh, great to see you again. And thank you for your generosity and sharing an hour with us. And John Valverde, we've never met before, but it's wonderful to meet you. I encourage our audience to go to our website, www.singsingprismmuseum.org. You can see all the Justice Talks programs. And we're just delighted to be able to host this and look out for us uh, next year. Uh, happy holidays to all of you. And thanks again to our, our panel. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.